Uh, now we're going to go to RNA. I'm talking a lot about assembly, and uh, we will, uh, again, I would like to take a break, but actually we're almost done with the whole program. So if you need to stretch, stretch. Uh, but I'm just going to load my, my slides up here, and then uh, I'll take you through RNA-seq. Let me show you one last thing before we end the atmosphere. Uh, so right now, you're using these virtual machines. Um, and uh, let me just close VNC Viewer. Even though I quit VNC Viewer, that does not shut down my machine. Uh, so you actually need to, take, you need to select your machine that you're working on. And then uh, once you select it, you have the option here to terminate it. So unless you're going to be going through this tutorial, and, and trying some other things. If, this is, if you're kind of done with it for right now, we ask that you terminate uh, the, in, the instances so that uh, those resources are returned to people who are actually doing real annotations and real science right now. Um, all right, so the slides have been posted for RNA-seq. Um, I'm going to go through this at a reasonable qu uh, clip. I will try to take you a little bit into the discovery environment just to orient you. But again, this is a lot of a show and tell, get you oriented. The, uh, another advantage of this, Josh's materials and Mike's materials are this is the first time we presented them here. Um, so they will be written up and posted online. They already appear. The one that I'm doing, we've been doing for a little while. So actually, there's really detailed step-by-step -step instructions in this handout with the, uh, so the blue label. So starting on page 28, they're really detailed step-by-step -step instructions. Uh, and this is also online, I'll show you later. So, Almost all of these will, uh, at some point, have very detailed step-by-step -step so that, again, uh, that's the best way to learn, uh, to do it yourself uh, and then uh, take it with your own data. Let me just find one article that I found interesting. Uh, let's see if I find it was in Nature by Ian Korf over at UC Davis. I liked his little cartoon. Uh, everything, especially with Maker, um, is very automated, right? Uh, and sp especially for the grad students in the room and postdocs thinking about will they have a job uh, doing any of this if everything can be done by bioinformatics. But this is a recent article which I suggest you Google. I think I put a sl uh, one slide in there, or maybe I didn't I have time yet, about uh, just a, a short review from Ian Korf. I think he's assistant director at the bioinformatics core at UC Davis, uh, just going over RNA-seq. And he's got this little cartoon of basically this is still where we're at when it comes to uh, doing RNA-seq. Uh, when it comes to the different software and the different programs that are out there, let me zoom on the cartoon because it's so cool. Uh, our reaction is basically whatever software package is out there, I'll take them all. I'll try every one of them. Uh, and you know, basically, it's still people trying to piece things together because his uh, take on things is no matter what RNA-seq software package you use, even though they are advancing, they still uh, all have uh, their shortcomings. And the, the answer that we just have to keep reinforcing for everything is no matter what software you're using to do RNA-seq or any of these, you still have to get a feel for the data. In fact, that's what my slides begin with. So I'll jump right into them, and then I'll try to show you at least some of this in the discovery environment. So let me find my slides back here somewhere. Atmosphere. Let's see. Ah, this one. It's the same one. This one is actually probably, and I should just open it from the wiki, because I added one more slide. And then uh, the last thing that we'll end with today is some presentations from KBase and Grameen. OK, there we go. Better. OK. Um, so these slides are, are there. I'm in, in no way in the, in the sort of a 20 minutes I'm going to take to go through this going to go uh, to um, eye-goring depth on how you do every single element of RNA-seq. But I hope to orient you as to how you can do this in the discovery environment, and perhaps a lot simpler than what you've done before, especially as you see with the command line, that's not your native environment. You may be a little bit lost. So we can uh, do that a lot easier through the discovery environment. Uh, the sample uh, that 
we've chosen uh, as some sample data for doing RNA-seq is just this Arabidopsis example where you have a transcription factor mutant, high five. Uh, and we expect in an experiment like this, which we actually down downloaded from the sequence read archive, that when you have a, a mutant, in this case a uh, transcription factor, that the knockdown or the knockout of that is going to lead to changes in the transcriptome that you're going to see in lots of different uh, pathways or systems. So in this case, and this is a, you can't see it too, too well up here, we're going to look at the wild type and the high five mutant and look at these uh, particular genes to see if we see what's, what's the difference. And so, of course, this is for differential expression. Now, use that word differential expression, you must be very, very careful because already we've made a mistake. We really don't want to suppose ahead of time that whatever changes we, we're going to see are really actually differential expression, right? Because there are many different types of changes that can affect uh, RNA abundance. It could actually be differential uh, degradation, right? That your transcript now is, is not going to be around as long as it would be. So you don't want to just, uh, even though we often say differential expression, remember your biology, there's all sorts of caveats to what you might see. Uh, and we downloaded this data, and we've got two replicates. So right off the back, uh, the best practice always, if you think you're going to publish, you must have replicates. Uh, and so definitely in the discovery environment, whether you're doing a time series or just a simple comparison of wild type and mutant, uh, you, you need at least uh, two replicates to go. So just a high level conceptual overview of RNA-seq. We expect uh, that from the transcriptome, given we have some nuclear DNA in this eukaryotic organism, we're going to have splicing of mRNA. Then from that, there, there's some fragmentation step, uh, selection, purification, amplification. Here's where biases and lots of other sorts of biological things happen. And finally, around here, uh, when we come to the bioinformatics step, uh, here is the issue. Because most of us can read a protocol. Um, I don't think they have a one-step uh, one extract and RNA-seq kit from Kaijin uh, yet. But that part, um, although it's very, very important, uh, most of us feel comfortable with. It's the bioinformatics that we want to uh, get a better feel for. Uh, so we did the sequencing, or in this case, the experimenters did the sequencing, and we have uh, about 10 million reads, uh, plus or minus, for each of our conditions. So two wild type and two of the mutant uh, replicates. Uh, in most cases, more is better, so the, the greater number of reads, uh, and this is something that people ask all the time, and it's always hard to give a very general answer. Uh, because people are concerned with how much do I need, what type of read length do I need, do I need really, really long reads or short reads. Uh, in general, if you're working with a, a, a genome that's been sequenced and is pretty well assembled, uh, the size of the reads is not the biggest factor. If you are looking to do a transcriptome assembly first, you're working with a de novo, you have to do de novo step first, then of course you want to go with paired N. But getting the most number of reads that you can afford for any particular experiment is going to be good, especially uh, if you're concerned with discovering novel isoforms or uh, other things. That's one of the value of RNA-seq, that you have that ability to pick out things that are not necessarily already annotated. Uh, so what's this? Anybody know what this is? I asked that question seriously. Yeah? You know? Yes? Say it. You don't have to. I'm not putting you on the spot, am I? I asked that question because uh, I very often ask how many people are doing RNA-seq, and maybe half the hands go up. But when they see this, they've never seen it before. And if you've never seen this before, this is your FASTQ file, right? But many of us haven't seen it before because we're afraid to even open it. Or maybe sometimes we can't even open it. I know the first time I opened it, my computer is running for like 20 minutes trying to load the entire file. Uh, this is a FASTQ file. And the problem here, again, uh, coming back to Cold Spring Harbor, uh, we don't have a feeling for the organism. Uh, our, our pain level at looking at some of this brings us to this area uh, where we're, we're not doing good as soon as we have to work in the command line world. And unfortunately, a lot of the tools are, are in that world. Uh, we really want to be back on this side with we have an idea of what the data is. And why I'm saying that you should open this up and look at this is really, um, I know people have wasted months working with data that somebody sent them and told them this is paired in reads, and it's not or vice versa. And if they had opened their file and they just had a little bit of comfort with it, then you can uh, get yourself 90% of the way there. You still may want to ask your bioinformatician uh, down the hall, but if she's got 20 other people uh, asking for help, 
and you can ask a simple question where you kind of already know half the answer, she's going to be much better uh, in helping you uh, than dreading your email when she knows you just want me to do your experiment uh, for, for you. Uh, so the FASTQ file is just a simple file. The thing that we all recognize is the sequence. And then these little uh, squiggly, seemingly random chosen but not, are just the quality scores that are given here, along with some information about where the sequence came from. So somehow, the bioinformatician, or bioinformagician is this little uh, cartoon, transforms all of this unrecognizable uh, stuff into what we want to see, which is reports and ultimately lists, hopefully, of gene names with a, a very uh, impressive uh, p-value or q-value saying that this is 20,000-fold upregulated and downregulated. Now, that's not going to happen um, to that level, but we definitely can get uh, a lot of the data that we want to get out of our, our results. I put these here not only because I stole figures from them, but just because I want you to know these are the papers that you need to read uh, before you start to go into doing RNA-seq. And in fact, the protocol that we're going to be doing um, in the discovery environment, the one that we're working with is the Top Hat protocol. Uh, and this is uh, one of the more popular packages. If you Google that first thing I mentioned by Ian Korf, uh, the point with any type of tools, we know that it has a limited lifetime, but Top Hat uh, and the, the related suite of tools is done well. I will also say that Top Hat is biased a little bit. It's designed for mammalian genomes. That doesn't mean you can't tweak this, the parameters there a little bit, uh, but you want to know that. There is another um, tutorial online, and I'll show it to you before I'm done here, where if you're working and you don't have a sequence genome, you don't have, you're not working in a Arabidopsis or some other really nicely done genome with plants, where you can um, not use Top Hat and still do the same uh, type of analysis where you get counts data and analyze uh, gene reads. Uh, so the way that the Tuxedo protocol works is you have your two conditions or time points, whatever type of multiplicity there, and those are put into an aligner, uh, Top Hat. Top Hat is going to attempt to take those sequence reads uh, and align them to the genome. So you absolutely must, with, top, uh, with the Tuxedo protocol, start out with a, a sequenced genome to start with. Uh, we have the genomes already loaded into iPlant. You can also just upload a FASTA if you have your own genome. Uh, from that, those map reads are going to be taken by Cufflinks, which is going to try to assemble the map reads into its best uh, possible transcripts. So, so these are completely de novo assembled transcripts made by cufflinks. And then uh, from those assembled, uh, cuff, uh, assembled transcripts, de novo, you have cuff merge. It's going to put everything into a final uh, transcriptome assembly. All of those, so the final transcriptome assembly uh, from, from cuff merge, the mapped reads that you got out uh, from this step in top hat are going to go into cuff diff. Uh, so top uh, the, the Tuxedo protocol gives you the advantage of you're not only looking at your assembled genome, but you're also looking at your de novo assembly that it does on the fly there, so that you not only have the opportunity to, to pull out uh, annotated genes and see results in that sort of biological context, but you also have the option for novel discovery of isoforms. So things that are not, that are annotated by Top Hat, but that don't appear in your annotation that you gave to it, um, will also be uh, available for you to interrogate. Um, so I'll show you this later, but this is sort of what I said, and this is also nice if you're going into this paper here, if you're going beyond the Tuxedo protocol on the iPlant Learning Center, uh, which is a preview. We're redoing the whole website, iPlant website, and the new Learning Center, but there's already some preview tutorials. I'll poke you to that a little bit later, but that's the one I mentioned for going with uh, de novo, completely unsequenced genome, and you want to do RNA-seq. Okay, so most of RNA-seq or the most important parts happen before uh, you even bring it into the computer, uh, the garbage in, garbage out. So if your data isn't, isn't good already, uh, we can't make it that much better. Uh, so I reference here this, uh, always developing standards is hard, but the ENCODE project, uh, which some of you may be familiar with, the Encyclopedia of uh, DNA Elements, who did a really, really great job looking, although they're looking at obviously uh, not plant genomes, uh, they have a whole list of standards for doing RNA-seq and, and library preparation uh, and the quality of the RNA that you're looking for. So I recommend uh, if you're doing RNA-seq and you're thinking about how do I prepare my library, how do I, what type of things do I need to think about 
when I'm actually doing the biological part. This is several pages, I forgot how many, uh, seven pages of uh, best practices, standards, and guidelines that they used, and perhaps some of them will be useful to you. So I recommend you look on that. Uh, that's the whole biological aspect before you even prepare the data. Um, so once you do have the data, ordinarily you'd go back to, let's say, even atmosphere, because Top Hat is on some atmosphere uh, images, and you could run these commands, and again, for the bio bioinformatician, uh, that's not too, not too many commands, pretty simple. Uh, but again, many of us just want to do the biology and, and not learn Linux, uh, not today. Uh, so what we have uh, in the iPlan environment, and I'm going to take you through a little bit of this to get you again oriented, is you're going to take your data and then get into the iPlan data store. I'll try to show you a little bit about that so that uh, even today, who knows, maybe you'll stop me during the meeting and, and ask me some questions because you, you're down here somewhere and you've gotten some part of it. So you, once your data is in the iPlant data store, then you go through that process in the discovery environment of the alignment all the way through differential expression, which will give you basically a file that contains the list of genes and contains the results and all that good stuff. Um, then here's where we sort of combine some different pieces of the cyber infrastructure. You could go to atmosphere, and atmosphere is where you could use R to visualize things. Uh, so you might then take your results, go to atmosphere, and then make some simple graphs. I'll show you, I'll, I'll attempt to show you all of that again in a cooking style format uh, in just a moment here. Um, so this is on the slide, and this goes into, and before we leave, I have like a little cheat sheet to hand you with some of the things that we sort of glossed over, so everybody will get a copy of the cheat sheet. Cheat sheet. But one of the things it references is how do you get your data into the iPlant data store? Some of them are really, really simple, like just install this little program on your desktop and drag your files over, and you may have a 50 gigabyte file and it'll just go ahead and zip over. Uh, we have some tools with iRods that allow that to happen a lot quicker uh, than you would over normal internet connection. Internet, generally two gigabytes is the limit because um, that's just the way the protocol is written. But with this, uh, we can do a little bit better. Uh, so I definitely recommend iDrop Desktop, and that's a really easy way, no command line, nothing. Just go ahead and drag and drop, and it will work. Uh, the other one, for those of you who are comfortable with the command lines, is iCommands. So you can install that. You can put that on your server where your data lives at your sequencing center, and you could automatically have the data always pushed into iPlant. So that's another easy way. After the meeting, I'm happy to uh, take those really specific technical questions. Okay, so let's assume that you have your data in, or if you uh, come back later on to follow with a tutorial that you have printed out or online, you go into the discovery environment, and you need to look at your data, because uh, I've, again, only mentioning these things because I've seen people not know. Uh, check to make sure that your data is actually a FASTQ file and not zipped up. Uh, so looking to see if it's a .gz or .tar, I've seen people waste uh, a couple hours because they're trying to use Top Hat and they didn't realize. If you click on the file in the discovery environment, it will open. And if it looks like you can't read it, it doesn't look like biology, uh, it's, it's still compressed. It's, it's zipped. So you can go in and use one of the uncompression, uh, decompression utilities to uh, decompress it. And then when you open the file, you should see again your DNA strands. Uh, the other thing that you want to do in terms of your de data preparation is to think about how your sequences is pro were processed. So you may need to, again, consult your sequencing facility. Did they already send you files with the adapters trimmed or not? How did they, did they do multiplexing uh, and then you have to demultiplex? Anything that you can get them to do for you, that's great. Um, but just make sure and take good notes and records on this because I've had people call me a couple literally years later and like, hey, you remember when you helped me out and you sequenced that stuff? I'm like, yeah. It's like, oh, what kind of machine was it and what was this? And I have 20 other questions that the reviewers want to know. Uh, and it's three years later and ha I kept the file from that person on my desk because I knew one day they're going to call me uh, for that. But make sure you have your own files uh, uh, and know how you did this. Again, with our <coughs> test tubes, we have notes and notebooks, but with files and metadata, sometimes we're not as fastidious as we need to be. Um, so I'm going to not go very quickly, uh, or I'm going to go very quickly, I'm not going to go in depth in this because this is very much what Mike showed earlier. You can go through and do the same fast QC process. Uh, these slides just take you through what is a good uh, and what is a bad 
uh, sequence look like. I guess this is really too perfect. Maybe sometimes you'll get that, uh, you know, that's what Illumina probably tells you you'd get. Uh, but it might look very much like this. And it gives you a little bit of an idea of what those lines represent and uh, why something is a, is a fail. So for instance, here again, uh, in this case, per sequence quality scores, there's a whole bunch of sequences in your pile here where you've got bad. I think Mike showed you a spike here, which again, might just complain to the sequencing center. I've seen, uh, I won't name, but sometimes sequencing centers just hope that you don't call them on something that was really their fault. So pay attention to these things. So that's all there uh, for you to go through. And if you had specific questions, you know, we can take those. Um, the other thing, um, and the ones that I put up here, even though the FASTQ gives you several, these are the most critical ones. The other ones, if you fail, or you get a, let's say you get a warning, you may be able to proceed or recover, but these you really want to pay attention to, these several uh, that I picked out on the slides. Uh, this one is also important to make sure that you don't have uh, things that are still left over from your primers or your vectors or whatever it is. Uh, so Top Hat goes in and it does the uh, uh, alignment of those individual reads, however long they are, so uh, 50, 50 base pair, 100 base pair, and starts aligning them to the genome. And it uses its own aligner bow tie. Bow tie is a, is a nice aligner, but it doesn't work well with the idea that we're looking at, at RNA that's actually spliced. And so when it comes to junctions, uh, top hat working together with bow tie sort of makes that all work together. Um, and again, this is just a caveat that this is tuned for mammalian. So if you want to use it for a different uh, class of organism, what they recommend in the user manual is that you use more conservative defaults. So you just want to go through, uh, read the slides, but look at the user manual. I've tried to pick out some things that if this is your first time, you want to pay attention to. Uh, and you can even, as a sort of a Josh used IG, uh, IGV, you could even look in atmosphere and, and bring your data over in, uh, from your top hat output and visualize this. And here's where some people are asking about SNPs and variants. You can already start to see uh, any types of SNPs that appear in this type of readout. Um, but at this point, we haven't assembled anything. Uh, here, uh, I think I say it, or I don't say it here, when you bring over your BAM files, there's actually two outputs from uh, Top Hat, a BAM file and a .bai, and an index. You need to bring over both files, but you only actually need um, to open the BAM file. Uh, then you go through the next step with cufflinks. Cufflinks is going to go in uh, and go into a little bit all right, pull the, uh, the, the, the figure here as to how that goes. I'm not going to go into the math now. I just want to go past it. But one cool thing to think about cufflinks, uh, here is another part of your biological prep about depending on how you did your RNA-seq prep, because I was interested uh, when I was doing this my first time with um, plastid uh, RNAs, which are not polyadenylated for the sake of uh, transcribing. They're polyadenylated if you want to degradate. So uh, I had to worry about depletion. You can actually provide a mask file. So depending on what your context is, you may have ribosomal RNAs if you didn't do a poly, poly a purification. There are some ways that you can remove uh, uh, things, abundant, abundant sequences that you really don't want to include in your analysis. And then you already start at this uh, step with uh, cufflinks to get some files that are of interest. So the transcripts that were assembled and then different isoforms that uh, are, are connected to those transcripts and genes. Uh, so those are there. And again, I have pulled out the section from the user manual that explains some of them. And in cuff merge, uh, that's again the assembly of the cufflinks transcripts. It's reference-based assembly. I'll try to show you at least the first step of this in discovery environment. And then I'll take you to atmosphere because I'm running short on time. Let me pull out some other things that are important to know. And this is really cool about uh, what you get when you're doing the analysis with a tuxedo package. One thing that's really cool is that you can actually use to look at uh, the variation in read counts uh, across the replicates. And once you calculate those expressions, it groups isoforms according to the same uh, transcription start sites. So one question that you might want to have is if you imagine that there's isoform A and isoform B, you might want to know not only does the gene you know, go up or down, but is in this condition isoform A prominent and in the other condition isoform B is prominent. So because you have that grouping, you can actually look by conditions and see what is the makeup 
for things that are really from the same gene, but perhaps different isoforms, they, they have different uh, transcription start sites, you can group these and get some really cool um, outputs of this. Uh, and again, your sequencing depth here is important if you want to pick up some of those events, especially if they're rare. Another important thing to think about, I modified this uh, slightly, is that the change, change in fragment counts is not equal to the changes in expression. So again, doing this all through Top Hat, it's important to at least know that there's normalization that's uh, taking here, because obviously, just because you have a lot of counts, uh, that doesn't mean as much if the gene is really, really long. Oh, I have a lot of counts. Well, my gene is a really gigantic gene versus I have le less counts, but the gene is smaller. So it's actually a little bit of normalization uh, so that the true expression is the sum of these uh, normal, normalized transcripts and read counts. So Kuftis comes out with these results. And again, I list them here for you to be able to see some, some of the interesting ones. They're all interesting. But there are a couple others on differential splicing or coding sequence promoter, et cetera. What you will get out when you're done, uh, and in this case, we use Arabidopsis, uh, so we have already the annotations and the genomes put out, is what you want. Uh, and in this case, it's back to the, the second most popular bioinformatics platform, which is Excel. You can go ahead, right, and you can look at your genes and you can sort them. And the, f the first most important bioinformatics platform in the world, Google, right? I mean, because you need to be able to search for all these different things and you have no idea what you're doing, so that's what we all do. Um, but now you have in a familiar format that you can start to work with it, uh, whether you want to be in the discovery environment or not. In fact, you can, in the discovery environment, filter, uh, and there's an app there if you want to just choose by a different p-value or whatever type of uh, filter, you can pull those out. And that also works very well as you get more comfortable in Cummerbund. Um, the discovery environment will also output some plots that are just uh, default, but in Cummerbund with R uh, in Atmosphere, you can do a little bit better than this. They do come out to sort of show you, in this case, a scatter plot of the genes wild type versus high five, and you see systematic downregulation. Uh, here's a log fold change with the significant genes in blue here uh, in this volcano plot. Uh, so Cummerbund is what allows you to do that. I'm going to take about five more minutes because I'm not going to push this over time uh, just to show you in discovery environment, what's the first step if you want to do the tutorial? And then I'll uh, show you in atmosphere starting Cummerbund. Let's see if I can do all that in about five minutes. So back in the discovery environment, and if you are on, just to give you an orientation on page 28, uh, just so you know how this works. And I'm going to as much as uh, I think Josh wants an RNA-seq done in his uh, I want to log out somehow. Let's close all these windows that have been op operating. And of course, I just changed my password recently, so hope I kind of remember what it is. Okay. Okay. So here I am in the discovery environment, uh, and I'm going to uh, go ahead and go to data. And all the files that we're working with for this uh, demo is actually in uh, the community data store. So I'm already just going to open that and keep that to the side. So if I click on community data, and then click on iPlant training, and then I'm going to look for intro RNA-seq. See, it's still loading. And when you go here, so intro RNA-seq, this is really uh, step three. It's giving you the whole path. I have all of the, all of the cooking show uh, results there. But the input data, if I click on that, really is just those few uh, FASTQ files that we want to start out with. Uh, in fact, there are four of them, two wild type and two uh, mutant. So I'm waiting for that to load. 
because I'm wire on wireless up here like everyone else. OK. And again, if I click on those, I can uh, comfort myself with the knowledge that uh, it really is a FASTQ file uh, and feel comfortable uh, looking through it. In the discovery environment, it doesn't load all at once. You can sort of flip through the pages, so that's really nice for uh, big files. All right, so to start this, I go to analyses, or rather apps, I'm sorry, and then I could just search for Top Hat, um, and I want to use the Top Hat uh, 2 for single end reads in this case. So these are single end, and I'm using Top Hat 2. One thing in the discovery environment, we like to keep all the old tools and old versions because very often you need that reproducibility. So the older things are there. Uh, I'm going to leave my analysis name as it is, but you could always rename it, uh, whatever you'd like. And for my input data, I'm going to go ahead and drag over. So it says I need these FASTQ files. I can add uh, a, 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 the individual files, or I can drag and drop. So I'm just going to select these all and drag them over into there. Um, you have the option of aligning the reads separately or, or together. I just usually leave it in default. And I scroll down. Uh, what I need to set is a reference genome. So in this case, it's Rabidopsis. Uh, so I'm going to choose. The, it doesn't really matter if you use 14 or 19. What does matter is that whatever I use here in the reference genome, um, I use later on and I keep using. So here I've used the 14, Ensemble 14. If I had my own genome and I wanted to use that as a FASTA file, I have the option to upload it here. If I go to reference annotations, I, uh, I need to select the exact same thing. And then in this case, I'm going to leave the reasonable defaults for analysis options. And I would click launch analysis to run that. Now, I'm not going to do that now. I've already got it done. When you click launch analysis, as you may have already seen because maybe you've done some things earlier, uh, those results end up in your analyses folder. When something is in here, it could have different status of values, like it's running or it's idle or things like that. If you made a mistake, you might go in. You might also choose cancel. If I need to change my parameters, I'm going through and I, I want to change things quickly, I can click here under app, or I could actually click under, uh, if I select one, I could click under relaunch. And I could click that app. It opens the app again. And I could just go through and reset individual parameters uh, that I wanted to reset without changing everything else. But in this case, I'm just going to click on the name of the app, and it's going to take me, in this case, I opened Cufflinks. It's going to take me to the actual um, results. So it'll go right into the folder where your output was. So really, all you have to do um, is follow the step-by-steps uh, that are on this document. And you can go through the top hat, the Cufflinks, uh, Cuff Diff, and you'll be able to uh, sort of step-by-step -step look at those results. Uh, when you do finally get through all of that, um, you could then, if you want to go and visualize some of this stuff, so let me, uh, this is the last thing I have time for, go to Atmosphere. In Atmosphere, there's an, uh, there is an instance or an image there called uh, RNA-seq visualization, um, and that happens to have, and you can also search for instances. Uh, the RNA-seq visualization instance has uh, R and it has Cummerbund already installed. Or you could search under Launch New Instances. There's a whole catalog of all of these instances. You could search through it. And you could also search for you know, Cummerbund. But this one I already you know I have running and has it installed. So I can connect to that. And if it wasn't full screen, I could actually see my IP address. OK, this is sort of a review. OK, now in this case, this, this instance, the RNA-seq visualization, uh, already has a cuff outputs there for me. So I don't really have to do a lot. Let me, though, just open up. And I'll post this on the wiki later. There is a, um, there's a section I'll post this to that already has all the commands or many of the basic commands. I'll even post my slide deck on that in R. Uh, so the first thing when you are in, uh, in atmosphere, and I'll make this bigger for us, uh, oops, 
is, uh, of course, start R, capital. Uh, and then we have to You, of course, need to uh, have the capital R there. Uh, the next thing, uh, when you load Kamraban, I suggest, suggest you uh, check that you have the latest version of it. So you need to, to do citation. And yep, yeah. OK. Just to make sure that you have that. And if I spell things right. Okay, I've got version uh, 2.0, uh, 2 and we've got all of that there. Okay, and so you take your, you create an object in R, cancel, uh, where you read in your cufflinks thing. So let me actually switch so I'm in the right directory. I'm just going to make one graph. And then it's, uh, whoop, I see what I didn't have to load the library again. Because I had exited. See, I, it's always good to see the teacher make a mistake. There's nothing more pleasing than seeing your PI fail at something that you've tried, so. All right, now we can go back in and load. Okay. And if somebody was actually keeping up with me, that'd be great. Okay, so it reads in um, your data from cufflinks. And once you read in the data from cufflinks, a lot of the commands are really uh, pretty simple. Uh, so if you want to see the number of genes and the number of uh, samples and all that sort of uh, data, you're just going to enter cuff again. This one, this one has already been uh, already preloaded into atmosphere. So the very first time when you load atmosphere, in fact, in this one, uh, you, you, all of them have something called I commands installed, and there are tutorials online. But you could also use iDrop or any of those programs where you can bring in the data. I'm waiting for this to, to finish. Uh, and then once you bring in your data from your results, you can make any of these graphs at will. And here in the tutorial, and I'll post the actual R commands to the wiki, uh, it's, there, there are a couple simple ones, but if you go back to the, the cufflinks uh, manual, you'd be able to uh, see a, a variety of other ones that aren't even posted there. While I'm waiting for this, are there any questions so far? Because this is the last thing I'm going to show you with, uh, with this. All right, hopefully this is almost done. If I knew it would take this long, I would have done it already. But I think it's at, at the just about the last step. OK, cuff. OK, and then I see the, the number of genes that I have in my sample data set, the isoforms, all of those different things. And then there are various plotting functions. So if you do this uh, squared coefficient of variation, and I can choose to do it on just the genes of the cuff object. Uh, you can go through and generate at will all of these uh, graphs. And you can tailor them and mess with the axes or mess how you uh, plot all of these uh, following the directions that are here. Uh, but it doesn't take extreme amount of command line uh, finesse to get that working. Uh, so that is a quick sort of almost commercial uh, for the things I promise that you'll be able to do uh, when you come back and look through the tutorial. If you go online to the iPlant Learning Center, there's a whole video on it. So if you go, and I'm going to turn over to uh, Marcella from Grameen, you will be able to follow up on iPlantCollaborative.org. And it's a preview here, but down at the bottom in the iPlant Learning Center, and you go to the tutorials, there's videos uh, and things to help you go through step by step what we did here. 
uh, and you can always follow, with, follow up with us. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Marcella, so we're not too far behind, and we're going to hear from Marcella and then from Doreen Ware uh, about uh, first Grameen and then also KVASE.